Hello everyone, welcome to session 3 of LTech 623. I want to begin this video with a little bit of housekeeping. One thing I've been meaning to mention to all of you is the open forum topic available in the Canvas discussion thread. Now the idea here is to have one topic open all semester so that anyone at any time can post either an idea, a question, or a resource. So I just wanted to let you know that this is available in Canvas anytime you stumble across something that you want to talk about or share with the rest of the class. This is just informal and I encourage everyone to take advantage of it if you're interested. Now another thing I wanted to recommend is considering installing a video speed controller for your browser. So for example, this speed controller, it allows you to speed up or slow down and advance and rewind any audio or video that you're consuming in your browser. This one happens to work in Chrome, but there are ones for Safari and for Brave and all of the other different browsers out there. Because we're gonna be watching a lot of video this semester, I really think this is a powerful tool that allows you to slow things down and speed things up so that you can adjust the speed to a level that's comfortable for you. Next, I want to talk a little bit about tips for high quality video reflections. Now, as you can imagine, the goal of the critical reflections is to strive for a thoughtful reflection. Now, importantly, because we're using Loom to record these, I want to differentiate our weekly video reflections from video productions. These weekly reflections reflections are not meant to be formal video productions for the class digital video design. We will focus on formal video productions later in the semester starting around week six. But really what I'm looking for with your weekly reflections is evidence that you can apply the course concepts to whatever the weekly activity is specified in the assignment. Another tip is it's really important that you are able to connect to the course readings in the course concepts. I'm looking for evidence that you've done the reading, that you've thought about the readings and the ideas in them, and that you're able to bring them to the weekly activity. Of course, if you've done your own reading and have external resources that you want to bring, by all means, include those in your reflections. Now, finally, please use your camera. That's one of the reasons why I encourage everyone to use Loom. The rationale behind using both your camera and your slides is, I believe believe this is valuable from a social and interpersonal perspective, especially in the asynchronous context. By including your video, it gives us a little bit more information. It helps us get to know and recognize each other in this class. And importantly, I want to remind you that in Loom, Loom allows you to move and resize your video feed as you record so that it's not in the way. Uh, a few tips for thinking about how to create high quality video reflections. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about analyzing an instructional video. I gave you a video to look at, and last week, of course, we talked about learning with video and some of the elements that go into learning with video. And so one of those aspects, of course, is the technological infrastructure. And that has to do with what's possible technically. Think controlling and editing and bookmarking. And of course, we could have talked about earthquakes, the seismograph, from a technological infrastructure structure perspective. Of course, that wasn't the assignment, but we could have done that. We could have also thought about it from a task structure. In other words, how might we as educators use this video with learners? What is the task the learners are asked to do? And you can see I've highlighted some of the information that go comes along with this video, such as support materials for teachers and discussion questions that can be used with learners. But again, our activity wasn't related to that. Another aspect, of course, was the social structure. And this has to do with the social context in which the video is being used. And we could imagine that this video might be part of a unit on earthquakes. Part of the social structure might have been having the students in the class interview a seismologist, or perhaps they might interview a bunch of panelists who were earthquake survivors. So you could imagine the social structure around using this video as kind of background information, or maybe a bunch of students would watch this video together and then have a conversation about what it means. 
Our task this week, of course, was to focus on the video content. In other words, the independent dimensions of this video production, including its production style, which is obviously a chalk and talk, as well as its production value and its visual aesthetics. And you folks did a great job with that. You really broke down some of its strengths and weaknesses. You looked at different timestamps. You looked at how motion was used. You looked at different aspects of the production value. So well done. The point of doing that, of course, was to help all of us begin to develop an eye for instructional video design. And to kind of illustrate this point, what I want to do now is compare and contrast that video with a more recent Chalk and Talk video. So let's take a look at the two examples. There was something to be learned here. A review of first-hand accounts revealed that the earthquake had produced two distinct types of motion, a tremulous vibration followed by a wave-like undulation. The understanding of these vibrations would be advanced by the development of the seismograph. It was an instrument that could record and display these seismic waves. A heavy pendulum remains stationary because of its inertia, even as the world all around it shakes. How a seismograph works. A seismograph is an instrument used to measure the movement of earthquakes. A weight is suspended in a way that allows it to remain still when the ground moves. Most modern instruments use an electromagnetic mechanism for this. A writing instrument is attached to the weight, allowing it to record the movement as it happens. The word graph refers to the writing action. Most modern earthquake monitoring uses seismometers, not seismographs. Okay, so now that we've watched a little bit of these side by side, my question for you is, how do these two instructional videos differ in terms of their visual aesthetics and production value? And my hope is that by taking this class, you'll really begin to pick up on the details of the visual aesthetics and the production value of different instructional videos, and then importantly, begin to develop ways of actually being able to create videos that represent or embody some of these design decisions. Now with that, I want to move forward to talk about the Schwartz and Hartman article on designing digital video for learning and assessment. In this article, the authors point out that a significant challenge for any learning designer involves deciding exactly what people are supposed to learn. They argue that answering the question, what are people supposed to learn, helps determine the intended goal or outcome of the learning experience. To make this a little bit more concrete, they provide a useful example of asking an American to learn the sport of cricket. And they rhetorically ask, what is the goal of that learning? Is it to learn how to play cricket? Is it to learn how to explain the history of the game of cricket and where it came from? Or is the goal to learn how to discern or recognize a high level of cricket play versus a poor or amateur level of play? Or is the idea of asking people to learn about the sport of, of cricket simply to get them interested so that they want to learn more? The point of this example is that we should be clear about learning outcomes because how video would be used might be different for each of the outcomes. Building on that idea, Schwartz and Hartman developed a map of different learning outcomes to help educators use video more effectively. So what is this map? Well, it's really just a framework for matching different genres of video with different types of learning. And they created this because there are many different types of video and there are many different types of learning. And different applications of video are more or less appropriate for each type of learning. So they wanted to provide some structure to help people like us make more educated decisions about how to use video in support of a certain learning outcome. So let's take a closer look at the concentric circles of this diagram. As you can see, there are four levels. In the center, we have four broad classes of learning outcomes, seeing, doing, engaging, and saying. 
From there, we come to a layer identifying different approaches to achieving those learning outcomes. Moving outward one more level, we see the types of behaviors that we might expect from a learner if learning has actually occurred. And then finally, the outermost band specifies relevant video genres that might be applicable if we're trying to accomplish or achieve a certain type of learning outcome. So now let's take a closer look at each quadrant of the map. The first quadrant is focused on seeing. And we all know that videos can help people see things that can't be seen normally because they are too big or too small or too abstract. In this way, video can help promote familiarity. And how do they do this? Well, by introducing people to phenomena they are unlikely to have seen before. This idea really counts on people recognizing what is new and what is novel. And of course, relevant genres that apply to this approach have to do with tour videos or portrayals such as period pieces, nature shows, historical recreations, so on and so forth. Videos can also help promote discernment. And how do they do this? Well, they can help people perceive details they might otherwise overlook. This assumes novices may not see what is significant even though it is in plain sight because they don't know what to look for. In other words, this is all about educating perception. Relevant video genres include point of view videos, simulated experiences, or highlight videos. Now, one of my favorite examples of videos that promote discernment is the PBS show Antiques Roadshow. Now, if you've seen this show, you know that these videos feature experts highlighting important details about some antique that someone has brought into the show. So let's watch an example. It's manufactured by the Patek Philippe Company of Geneva, Switzerland. This is a photocopy of the original warranty depicting some of the complications of this watch. The front of the watch has the hour and minute hand and the second hand. Mm -hmm. It also has a split chronograph, so you can time two things. It also has a minute register for the chronograph. Off to the side is a slide for chiming the watch. It's called a minute repeater where you lift up the slide and it'll chime the time to the minute. Okay. When we flip the watch over, you have the day, the date, and the month, along with the moon phase. It's also a perpetual calendar, which adjusts for leap year. It's a very complicated watch. So there you have it, an excellent example of using video to help promote discernment. In this case, the expert was highlighting a number of the features or complications present on the watch and helping the viewer learn to differentiate the different characteristics of this valuable antique watch. Another quadrant of the map focuses on engaging as a learning outcome. And this has to do with video offering a pull that brings people to a situation or a topic and keeps them involved. The idea is to motivate them and prepare them for future learning. So how might we go about that? Well, according to Schwartz and Hartman, video can help promote interest by emphasizing how the target content is relevant and or engaging. The idea here is that we're piquing the viewer's curiosity or showing the relevance of the topic. Relevant video genres include advertisements, trailers, and quote-unquote triggers. In addition, video can help contextualize information. This is a way of engaging people. How? Well, by providing background information or activating prior knowledge. The idea here is to anchor the meaning of subsequent activities by contextualizing the learning and the problem solving that's to come. Relevant video genres related to contextualizing information have to do with case studies and or anchor videos. There are some very good examples of this out there. One really great example of promoting interest is the beauty of science videos focusing on chemistry. Here's an example of a video you might show to a class of students to get them interested in what's going on and preparing them for subsequent lessons on chemistry.
Excellent. So that's an intriguing example of how video might be used to engage learners. The third area of the map focuses on doing as a learning outcome. And the idea here is that video can be ideal for presenting human behaviors that others can model and learn from. Video can help shape attitudes by providing a model. One thing to be careful of here is that people can model other people so well that learning of attitudes can actually be unintentional. Video genres relevant to this quadrant include actual modeling of something or role playing and of course identification. Relatedly, video can help people learn skills by providing opportunities for learners to imitate the behavior shown in a video. Complex skills can be decomposed, replayed, zoomed in on, and slowed down. Of course, good procedural instruction discerns the behaviors that are significant. And we've all seen different types of demonstrations or step-by-step -step instructions to help us understand a particular skill. Here's an example of a skill video showing how to tie your shoes quickly. Hey guys, Josh here again. Today I'm going to show you a very simple trick that will revolutionize the way you tie your shoes. With a little bit of practice, you can do this knot in just under a second. Not only is it super useful, but it's also super easy to do. So, let's get to the tutorial. First thing we're going to do is to cross the laces, just like you would when you normally tie your shoes. Just make sure that the strand coming from the right is farthest away from you. And then you take the cord closer to you, coming from the left, and it goes over and back through. Again, just how you would tie your shoes normally. Once you get that, you should have this cord coming out the bottom of this loop right here and this one coming out the top. That is how you want it to look for the start. Now is what you're going to do. You're going to take your thumb and forefinger on your right hand. Starting with the right cord, you're going to loop your fingers underneath it and back around just like this. Now on the left cord, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to start farthest away from you and loop under. So now it should look just like this. And now here's where the magic happens. You reach through, grab this loop on top with your right thumb and forefinger. Then you reach way back here and grab this loop that is coming off of your, forf your right forefinger. And then you pull those tight. This is obviously a strong example of a video meant to help someone learn a new skill or advance an existing one. The final quadrant of the map focuses on saying as a learning outcome. And this is the idea that video and many other forms of media can help people verbalize facts and develop explanations. For example, video can help people acquire facts by conveying information at various levels of sophistication. Of course, other media are good at this too. The types of video genres that might be used here are associations or chronologies. The example Schwartz and Hartman use is Sesame Street and how that show routinely paired entertaining images with different names to help children memorize numbers and letters. We also have chronicles such as news broadcasts and narratives that deliver facts embedded within the context of a larger story. Video can also help people develop explanations by providing reasons as to why and how different phenomena occur. One thing to keep in mind with explanations is designers need to estimate how far to move away from facts towards explanations. The further one moves from facts, the more important it becomes to create videos that make processes and explanations transparent. Relevant video genres related to developing explanations involve analogies, commentaries, and expositions. Here's a simple example of an expository video explaining how lightning works. Can lightning strike the same place twice? Let's figure out what makes it happen in the first place. 
Lightning is electricity, and electricity involves tiny particles. Some particles have a positive charge, and some have a negative charge. The two opposite charges pull towards each other, like the north and south ends of magnets. Usually, electric charges are fairly balanced, but the turbulent winds of a storm cause electric charges to separate within the cloud. Most lightning occurs within the cloud itself, but we're concerned about the lightning between clouds and the ground. Lightning starts with negative charges moving from the clouds towards the ground. Scientists call it a stepped leader. Meanwhile, an upward leader forms as positive charges move up from the ground, usually from tall objects. When a stepped leader and an upward leader meet, it makes a path for a much larger and brighter electric current to shoot up into the cloud. This is what we see in the sky as lightning. It happens so quickly that lightning seems to travel from the cloud to the ground when in fact the opposite is true. Okay, before we wrap up, I just want to make the point that this map of different learning outcomes is simply a guide. The concepts in this map are not black and white, and many videos blur the lines between outcomes and genres, and that's okay. That said, I still think this is a useful framework for thinking about different genres of video. And finally, I think it's important to note that different genres of video can be produced using different production styles. In other words, one production style doesn't have a lock on one genre of video, even though there are, of course, some obvious conventions and patterns when it comes to using video genres for instructional videos. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.